Now it's time for RTB 101. This is the segment where we talk about practical questions to help train you to share your faith with friends and family more effectively. And one of the most common evidences for common descent is the existence of junk DNA. And here to help me talk about it is biochemist, Dr. Fuzz Rana. Welcome, Fuzz. Krista, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, this is a great question because I think that this is probably even an evidence for evolution that most people are at least aware of because it's just sure. in the news a lot. So yes. let's talk about, always like to start with a definition. Yeah. What is junk DNA and how is it used as an evidence yeah. for evolution? Well, loosely speaking, junk DNA refers to regions in the genomes of organisms that consist of non-functional DNA sequences. And there's a number of different classes of junk DNA that have been identified. And many people are under the perception that perhaps a vast proportion of the genomes of organisms consist of junk DNA. So non-functional DNA doesn't right. seem to perform a function. That's exactly so right. So what is it doing there is kind of the thought. Yes, I okay. mean, why would a creator create genomes of organisms, like let's say human beings that has 95% non-functional DNA? Got it. It, this doesn't look like the handiwork of a creator, but something that evolution would produce. And Some sort of evolutionary leftovers? Is that the idea? Y yes. Okay. And, and, you know, and there's a number of ways in which the different types of junk DNA can be generated according to evolutionary biologists. Okay. For example, you could have functional regions in the genome that get damaged, or uh, a viral infection can take place, and that viral genetic material gets incorporated into the host genome and then gets rearranged. And, and, and genetically altered. Okay. And so people argue that the, we know how these junk DNA sequences presumably form, and it looks like they're evolutionary processes, not the handiwork, again, of a creator. Okay, so that sounds to me, just on the surface of it, to be pretty slam dunk evidence of the, to, to support biological evolution or common descent. Yeah, it's a very strong argument. Okay. And what's even more troubling is that you have shared sequences of junk DNA in genomes of organisms that cluster together naturally. So humans and chimps, for example, share a number of junk DNA sequences in corresponding locations in our genomes. So when you put this all together, you got a very compelling case for biological evolution. So if humans and chimps are on the same kind of evolutionary tree and they have similar quote unquote junk DNA sequences, maybe that traces back to some common ancestor back there where they got that. That's exactly right. Okay, yes. so help us think this through from a creation model perspective because we have reasons right. to believe we are more skeptical that right. that evolution is true, but this seems like compelling evidence, yeah. so walk us through that. Well, you know, I remember when I officially started with reasons to believe back in 1999. You and I started almost the same time. Yeah, yeah. we did. Well, you know, there was really nothing we could say at that time in response to this junk DNA challenge. In fact, one of the first articles I wrote was addressing the junk DNA issue, and I made the prediction at that time that we would eventually discover that junk DNA has function. And so that's kind of the expectation from a creation model perspective, is that this junk DNA, if it is functional, then you could understand it as reflecting design elements in the genome and the shared features reflecting, you know, shared design. Okay. Yeah. So when when you started, I think I even remember that article. It might have been called like GNA, DNA uh, not so junky or yeah, something. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is the article. <laughs> this might be still on our website. It could be a golden oldie. But uh, now, as you're thinking about it, were, did did you have a sense of the prophetic then? Like, how is that trend line developed since 1999, where you were kind of dipping your toe in the water, saying, "I think this might have function." Where are we at now? Well, this is the thing that's remarkable. Is I remember in the 2000s when the discoveries began trickling in, saying, "But wait a minute, what we thought was junk turns out to be functional," and then the pace of those discoveries picked up. And it looked as if these weren't just simply oddities here and there where junk DNA evolved function, but it seemed to be pervasive. And kind of the capstone was in 2012 when the ENCODE project published phase two results that indicated a vast proportion of the human genome and likely the genomes of organisms very well may be functional. And since that time, 
There are mounting discoveries that indicate virtually every class of junk DNA is functional. So we've seen a complete revision of how we think of genomes from being a, a wasteland of evolutionary debris to actually being these incredibly elegant and sophisticated systems that are far more complex than anybody would have ever imagined. So maybe you turned out to be a little bit of a prophet. After yeah, well, all. <laughs> I, or it, it's showing that this idea of a creation model has actually merit. There it it's, is. It's the proper way to think about biology because if it if it indeed the creation model is true, what we predicted with junk DNA should have turned out exactly the way that it has. So the the nomenclature of junk DNA that that kind of needs to almost be done away with. It yeah. seems like it's not really indicative of what the current understanding is. That's right. And in fact, many people are now agreeing that this it was premature to conclude that junk DNA was indeed junk. Very good. Well, I would encourage you to check out Fuzz's blog. You can go to our website and uh, do a search for the cell's design.